Well, that's a pretty tough intro to live up to. You know, I'd like to think that uh, I was recruited into my current position uh, primarily on the strength of my accent. You know, if you're going to uh, run something called the Texas Center, you need to sound just like this. So, uh, you know, I've, I've had people call me and say, you know, I was on a cruise ship in the middle of the Pacific. I couldn't sleep because the boat was rolling, so I turned on the in-house entertainment, and I heard you. <laughs> so, here we go. Um, go down here. So, here is Tom Green. This uh, portrait of Tom Green was done by a guy named Keith Borders who was a reenactor buddy of one of my students and was a uh, restaurateur in Tampa. And Keith did this painting, uh, needed a uh, little money for his medical bills, and I paid what he asked, which I thought was way too little, and then Keith died. But this portrait right now hangs at the Museum of Western Art. And if you have a chance to go by that museum, which is just literally across the river from here, I mean, it's not even a 12-pound Napoleon shot from here. It's like a 12-pound howitzer shot from here. Uh, we've got a bunch of art from the Texas Center and across the campus here at Shriner, all on exhibit over there. So if you come to the Texas Center right now, it looks a little bare because we moved a bunch of our art over to there. But this portrait is one of my favorites. I've had people... Uh, uh, really interested in uh, relieving me of this portrait. Uh, but that's him in front of St. Emma Plantation. St. Emma Plantation is down near Donaldsonville, Louisiana, and the site of his best battle, Cox's Plantation, which I'll talk a little bit about here in a second. Consider this quote. Tom Green didn't have a bard for about a hundred years. And then I discovered him at the Confederate Memorial Hall in New Orleans. I was in New Orleans on my honeymoon. And what does one do on your honeymoon to go to a bookstore and museum? I figured out that New Orleans was a terrible place to take your brand new wife, who's, you know, all white lace and promises. Great place to take a girlfriend if you have one, but not a wife. So in that facility, I ran across a little book called um, Battle in the Bayou Country by a newspaper guy named Morris Raphael from New Iberia. And he wrote this little sort of pulp book that was a quick read. And I was 22 years old, coming uh, into um, kind of my earning years after getting a degree in journalism, and I was working for a newspaper. I'd done Texas Rangers baseball television back when they stunk. Two whole seasons enduring that bunch, and now they win the World Series. Um, so it was, uh, that read was to my liking because it was quick, and it introduced me to a guy named Tom Green. And the fact that he had fought in New Mexico and Louisiana, and I'm going, I thought the Civil War happened in Virginia. That's where Hood's Brigade was. And then I figured out, wait, Civil War just in Texas is not just all about Hood. So, sorry, Hood's <laughs> Texas Brigade Association. I'm going to give you a view from a different direction. So there's the pantheon of Texas Civil War heroes. You know, you got Hood's, you got Terry's, you got Granberry's, Ross's, Eckers, Walker's. Then you get Green's Brigade and then Parsons Brigade, and they kind of start dribbling off after that. So where does Tom Green fit in this sort of celestial hierarchy of the poets? Well, in 1876, he was the guy. People were talking about Tom Green in Texas in 1876, and he was memorialized by the presentation of a portrait that hung in the lieutenant governor's office. When the Capitol in Austin burned in 1880, that was one of the things that people ran in to rescue. So he was a big deal in 1876, and yet by the time I was 22 in New Orleans, I'd never heard of the guy. 
So why did Texans love him so? Two different portraits of him. Younger man, older man. Well, herein lies the tale. So if you take a look at this uh, very famous painting of the surrender of Santa Ana from um, San Jacinto, you'll notice that I have an arrow pointing down. That's Tom Green. He was one of the uh, inaugural class of Texas heroes. He was actually at that fight and is memorialized in this famous painting. But he is, like so many Texans, a son of Virginia, also of Tennessee, and also of the law. So he was actually a college boy heading toward the legal career like his daddy. His daddy, Nathan Green, uh, was on the Tennessee Supreme Court. And Tom was reading law, but then all of a sudden he started seeing circulars about Texas and the need for volunteers to come and uh, help Texas win its independence. So Tom Green skipped class. I mean, he just left school and said, I'll see you later, Dad. I'll be back. And went to Texas. Now, after San Jacinto, his dad said, now, would you come up and finish your degree? And he did. Dutiful son. He came back and finished his studies. But that's the kind of guy Tom was. He was a restless youth. Oldest of seven kids. I'm the youngest of ten kids. So I understand what these sort of large family dynamics are about. I'm just looking at it from the caboose, and he was up at the engine. Um, there's his, uh, his bona fides as far as his education. He was an educated man. But Texas is tough to resist. Now then, since he was connected to people that had connections in Tennessee, Tom Green didn't just drift into Texas like so many. Tom Green came in with an introduction to Sam Houston, which at the time was a pretty important introduction to have. So once he goes to Texas and once he participates in the fight at San Jacinto, those aren't his only fights during the Republic period. So what I'll do now is I'll take you through some of the things that Tom Green was involved in. Let's start with the Twin Sisters. So he was one of the gunners that helped do the cannon charge at San Jacinto. You know, they had really no good uh, mechanism for advancing those guns other than, you know, sweat and muscle. And so they advanced those two six-pounders that had come down from Cincinnati, Ohio, uh, by hand. They prolonged them in keeping up with the infantry uh, regiments to the right and the left. And they held the center of the line. He was a gunner along with other people that you might recognize, including Ben McCullough. So he is on essentially the state championship 6A football team, to use a modern Texas analogy. You know, they all got the t-shirt in the ring. But here's some of his friend group, to use a uh, phrase that my girls grew up with. Ben McCullough, who I just mentioned, Later on as a Texas Ranger, uh, later on a pretty important Confederate officer who thinks that you can scout an Indiana regiment the same way you scouted a Mexican regiment. And it turns out he was wrong. And we all know the story from Pea Ridge. Uh, but also some of these other guys uh, are probably less well known to you. Uh, John Henry Moore, famous for being the guy that brought us to take and, or come and take it event at uh, Gonzales and also ends up becoming one of the leading sort of Texas Rangers of that early Republic period. Jack Hayes uh, over to the left, or yeah, I guess that's lower left. Uh, Jack Hayes is one of the first professional Texas Ranger officers and also raises the first Texas Mounted Rifles uh, or Hayes' Regiment during the U.S.-Mexican War and is a legendary fellow as well. Tom Green was a captain in that regiment. Uh, Thomas Jefferson Rust. Thomas J. Rusk is a, a fixture in Nacogdoches. He was the Secretary of War. He was the General of the Army. Uh, he was one of the great shapers of the Republic of Texas, and Tom Green was his orderly for a while. So he touched some of the most, or his, lives inter his life intersected with some of the most famous Texas 
shakers and movers of that time period. During that time period in the Republic, he rode with John Henry Moore and others on campaigns against the Comanches. So this guy not only saw action at San Jacinto, but he also participated in mounted partisan-style warfare against the Comanches, which will end up uh, being some lessons that he will apply on other fields. Uh, one of the things that John Henry Moore uh, taught him was, uh, you know, if you'll just charge right through the middle of their camp before they have a chance to react, you will maintain the initiative and be able to dictate your will upon them. And we see that scene uh, actually in Lonesome Dove of all places, where the heroes ride right through the campfire and scatter everybody that's sitting around it. That was uh, one of the techniques that uh, Moore used against the Comanches that always kept them off guard. He's also, besides being a warrior, he is a servant. Uh, he is the clerk to the Texas House of Representatives. Green was never particularly comfortable making speeches uh, or standing up in front of a group trying to uh, convince people that uh, you know his way is the best way. But he was really, really good at making sure that the behind-the-scenes logistics worked, that things that were going on uh, that needed to go on were, in fact, going on. There's a lot of people that like to uh, showboat. He's not one of them. And that's the capital that he served in. <laughs> that's the, the Texas capital in uh, Austin, which is a glorified dog truck cabin. He is a Mexican War hero. Uh, he rides with Hayes' regiment, one of the captains. He's at the Battle of Monterey. And in the course of that fight, he not only... Uh, skirmishes with the Mexican cavalry on the approach to Monterey, but he conducts some of the house-to-house uh, -house fighting that goes all the way down into the center part of the town. And he is under fire the whole time and never flinches. Now, it's funny because he is in Mexico with a rival. And here's a guy that you may have heard of as well in different contexts, that's Sam Walker. And those of you that are firearms collectors, will recognize that name from the Walker Colt Dragoon. So Sam Walker is really Jack Hayes' right-hand man. Sam Walker and Tom Green are both fighting for the same girl, Molly Chalmers. Molly Chalmers is the oldest daughter of a couple of people. Uh, well, the, her dad was actually a major newspaper man in Texas and opinion leader. And so she's quite the prize. But she's got two suitors, and both of those suitors go out and fight in the U.S.-Mexican War. So one of the things that propels Green through the streets of Monterey is Sam Walker keeps daring him to do it. Because this might be a way of clarifying the claim. You know, this might be trial by Mexican musket and let the best man win. But it turns out they both came back alive. So that does not clarify Molly Chalmers' issue. Now, this portrait of Molly is actually her in her morning clothes. We have three images in the Texas Center collection of Molly Chalmers and also the Green Children, which you'll see here in a second. They are also on exhibit at the Museum of Western Art for the next month. <clears throat> Tom Green gets the girl because he stays in Austin and applies his military prowess to conquering her heart. Samuel Walker decides that he doesn't want to be tied down just yet, and he goes down to central Mexico with Jack Hayes, and Green gets the girl, Walker gets a lance through the heart, and dies in Mexico. Now, what kind of family did they establish? I love this quote. Can y'all read it in the back, or shall I recite it for you? Okay, I've tried to put it on extra big font. So I, I love that description of Texas women in the late 1840s and into the 1850s. Young, clever, and eminently and decidedly Texan. Well, what does that mean, you English novelist? Well, that means they're witty and sarcastic. 
and people are afraid of their criticisms. All right. Now, do you think that the women of Texas during this time period took this as an offense? Heavens no. Texans then, like Texans now, say, yeah, and what is your point? We've always been called haughty women, and we were proud of many things. That is Texas womanhood in so many ways. I've raised two of them, I know. Here is the Green family, and there's uh, Molly in the middle. Uh, there's Tom Green Jr. on the right, and there's Annie Green on the left. Uh, Tom Green Jr. would end up uh, having a family, and his children, or no, it's actually his grandson, Tom Green Jr.'s grandson, flies in the China-Burma-India theater during World War II, and we have his blood chip that uh, Chinese nationalist flag with the Chinese characters on it that say, don't sell us to the Japanese, we're on your side. Uh, that's actually hanging over in the Texas Center too. Uh, Molly Wiggins was a Tom Green descendant, and she uh, died without heir, in essence. So she asked me if I would take her Tom Green items into the collection that we have at the Texas Center, so we did. Now, Tom Green earns a, uh, a reputation. This is his nickname, Daddy Green. And the reason being is that top line. His in-laws die and leave all these other kids that are stair-stepped in age to, you know, pretty young. And Tom and Molly adopt them all and raise them all. She's the oldest daughter. She sees it as her duty. They raise a pile of kids. Uh, Green also owns slaves. So if that's a triggering event for you, there it is. He was a, a slave owner. He had enslaved people that worked with him, and that was part of Texas in the 1850s. Uh, what's interesting about the family that he owned was that it was an extended family. So he owned one family of enslaved people. Now then, Certainly they all got along and everybody was happy. Well, when Green took one of them with him out to New Mexico, when they got to El Paso, the enslaved servant that he took with him stole his horse and splashed across the river to freedom. So, you know, I'm not trying to portray this as everybody's happy and getting along and having a kumbaya moment. Uh, there's clearly some... Uh, um, complications with those relationships. But Green also had a pile of kids of his own. Not all of them lived. But his really uh, important job that he took with the Republic of Texas and then the state of Texas was that he ended up being the engrossing clerk of the Supreme Court of the state of Texas. Now, the Supreme Court of the state of Texas wandered all over the state holding court. So Green was gone from home a lot. I wonder why. That is bound to have been one remarkably busy household. And I think he went to hear all the cases in Texas for a little peace and quiet. But as the uh, clerk of the Supreme Court, Here's the people he was hanging out with. So that's John Hemphill on the left. That's Royal Wheeler in the middle top. James H. Bell, Abner Lipscomb, and Orrin Roberts. These are all the great jurisprudence thinkers of 1850s Texas. And these guys will shape Green's attitude. Here's what they said about him. So, you know, Green's legal knowledge, strict punctuality, and cautious demeanor, he combined with the qualities of a good clerk and those of an elegant gentleman. So here's a guy who was good at dinner, entertaining guests. He's also smart, and he showed up on time. Those are some great qualities. That's a hireable employee, if you ask me. So what did these guys rub off on him? Well, Green is a states' rights disciple after working with these guys, especially Hemphill. 
And when the secession crisis came to Texas, here is how he wrote about it in a letter to his dad. And I'm going to read it because I know that's probably too small for the back. It said, the battle for the right to govern ourselves and control our own institutions had to be fought with the fanatics of the North at some time. And expected had, uh, it had as well be by us as our children. We are no doubt better prepared for the fight than our children and will bring more nerve to the conflict than they would as the injuries received from the nasal twanged self-righteous witch-killing fanatics are more recent with us or more fresh with recent and fresh with us yeah oh tom he certainly has an opinion so let's kind of break this down do a little bit of lit crit as they say on college campuses to this passage uh, he clearly feels as though northerners are overstepping their bounds. And it's interesting, uh, one of his brothers was thinking about either immigrating to Oregon or to Texas well before this, about a decade before this. And Green said, look, if you'll come to Texas, I will give you a farm. I'll just make you a gift of acreage. I'm long on land. So I'll just make you a gift of a farm. And, you know, don't go out to Oregon and settle amongst the Haddon otters. A Haddon otter. We're not talking about something that lays on its back and cracks oyster shells open. Not a sea otter. A Haddon otter is somebody who always wags their finger at you and says, you Haddon otter do this, you Haddon otter do that. And that's what Green resented. He didn't like people getting into his space. Now, does that remind you of anybody? Because I can tell you that is certainly part of the Texas double helix. No state sues the federal government more than us. So <laughs> that's why I say this is Tom Green, Texan. Now his dad is going, look, Tom, I know you're mad. But, you know, this is war. You've seen war before and war is a young man's sport. Not yours. And, you know, Green's in his late 40s. Uh, which sounds pretty young to me right now. Uh, but here's his response. It says, your remarks about the propriety of remaining at home by me during this war has been more maturely and deliberately considered than any subject that has ever been before me. And you can imagine as the clerk of the Supreme Court, there was a lot of matters before him. No man in the state has stronger ties at home than I have. Boy, you can say that again. I would go into the service if I positively knew that the first shot fired would kill me, for I am determined to bequeath to my children a name that they will in all future time be proud of. All right, so he is talking about, I will go to war to fight these self-righteous nasal twang witch burning Puritans, which is an interesting aspect of the national crisis. And I want you to think about President present day events. Tom Green is dragging all the way back to Puritan New England to describe his political opponents. I don't know if he recognized this in the dialogue going on around the state and the nation today, but there's a lot of dragging back to the past to try to frame present day identities. So this is an old technique, ladies and gentlemen. But he's decided that this is something i got to do, even if I know I'm going to get whacked doing it. And here's why. The whole state of Texas expects me to take part in this war, and I would feel that I had more grievously disappointed my friends and the people of the state if I had remained at home while the war was raging. But no man is looked to more to show his hand in this struggle. He felt an obligation to who? his friends, and his state. That sounds pretty Texan to me. So here's his next round of battles that we'll talk about, his Civil War battles, phase one. You know, he uh, joins the Confederate Army. We actually have his commission as a brigadier general in the Army of the State of Texas, issued in 1861, 
on exhibit at the Museum of Western Art across the river. Uh, he joins just and tells everybody, put me where I'll be most useful. And ultimately what that means is he raises the 5th Texas Cavalry or 5th Texas Mounted Rifles to begin with and helps form part of Sibley's Brigade, uh, Henry Hopkins Sibley's Brigade as it invaded New Mexico. So those are the first fights he's involved with. And so here's kind of a montage. It's one of those fancy college words for a bunch of pictures that don't seem to hang very well together, but it looked good on my screen at the time. Um, so we got Sibley over in the uh, lower right. We all know that one. One of the best Civil War portraits uh, that ever came out of that period from one of the strangest sort of generals <laughs> from that period. But over to the left is a painting by, um, oh, come on. Yeah, thank you. Um, Triani of the charge of the Texas Lancers at Valverde. Now, what's interesting to me about this painting is I contacted him back when I was in graduate school and going to get my book published. And I said, I need a painting of the charge of the Texas Lancers at Valverde. And he said, nobody paints trans-Mississippi stuff. Click, you know. Ah, well, look who does now. All right. The image down below, lower left, is uh, Peralta, the church at Peralta. And the church at Peralta is one of the places where Tom Green gets surprised and, and uh, uh, has to react. Uh, and he gets surprised because he's at a party. And we're going to talk about Tom Green's partying habits. Valverde is his win. Sibley was debilitated. Sibley, of course, is known for being a drunk. But what you don't, may not know about Sibley is he also had renal colic, which is chronic kidney stones. So the question is, did the drinking cause the kidney stones, or was decades of campaigning in the American West with crummy water causing the kidney stones that he deadened with alcohol? Hard to say. But he's laid up in the wagon and Tom Green takes over, and he wins that battle at Valverde. But he's not a flawless guy, as Peralta will point out. Now, that uh, photo in the upper part of that, that's actually the view of the Valverde battlefield uh, from the Mesa de la Contadera. So you can see that it's not exactly the rolling hills of the Shenandoah. Rough country. Here is what Tom Green thought he had earned out there. So General Sibley complimented me in presence of all the field officers in the brigade in such eulogistic terms that my face almost burst with shame, stating publicly that the Battle of Valverde had made me a brigadier and that there would be no doubt of my commission as soon as his report reached Richmond. So Green figured that he had a promotion coming, but instead he watched a lieutenant colonel get promoted past him to brigadier. He got passed over for promotion. Well, why is that? Because not everybody thought his performance in New Mexico was as admirable. Uh, one of his officers writes, Let the people of Texas see whether certain persons can stay in comfortable quarters in towns, soaking themselves with rum and whiskey, while others are doing the work. I could a tale unfold that would make Texas too damn hot to hold some men that up here have been carrying high heads. Ooh, not everybody's a Tom Green fan. Tom Green probably had a drinking problem. And when he comes back to Texas and discovers that his reputation is in tatters, He's kind of stunned. And he gets a bunch of his friends involved. He writes to John H. Reagan saying, look, you know, what can you do for me? And John H. Reagan kind of thinks Tom is a little toxic and kind of steps back and says, look, you know, he has been absolutely abstentious. He hadn't drunk anything since I've seen him and since I've known him. But, you know, 
You need to take account of people's doubts. So Green does not get his promotion even with him calling in favors. So when he sees an opportunity to restore his reputation at the Battle of Galveston, he jumps on it. And he says, all right, what do you need done, General Magruder? How can I help you? And put me and my guys in the toughest fix, and we'll see you through. So here is why he is not known as a great orator. Here is how he motivated his regiment. Soldiers, you are called upon to volunteer in a dangerous expedition. I have never deceived you. I will not deceive you now. I regard this as the most desperate enterprise that men ever engaged in. I shall go, but not, do not know that I shall ever return. I do not know that any who go with me will and want no man to volunteer who is not willing to die for his country and to die now. That's not exactly an elegant sales pitch. It's like, look, this is going to be tough. We may all get whacked. So if you're interested in getting whacked right this minute, come on. So Green makes that pitch, and his regiment turns out to a person. The 5th Texas is still uh, fans of Tom Green. It's funny, I was reading uh, one of the accounts of the paddle wheelers as they're leaving Harrisburg, going down Buffalo Bayou, making the turn there at Morgan's Point and heading out towards Galveston. And um, one of the soldiers turns to the skipper and says, hey, you know, we got all these cotton bales lined up as armor. This looks pretty strong. Think this will resist a cannonball? And the skipper goes, no. Won't even slow it down. Enjoy the ride. So his troops actually formed the boarding party on the CSS Bayou City, or at least part of his regiment did. Uh, and in that capacity, the Bayou City, cotton clad pictured here, uh, rams and carries by boarding the USS Harry Lane in one of the most dramatic you know, events uh, in Texas Civil War history. His reputation at this point is somewhat restored, but he is still not promoted. And when Sibley's brigade is shuttled off from Galveston and into Louisiana, Green is still just the colonel of the 5th Texas Cavalry. Who's the brigadier general in charge of Sibley's brigade in Louisiana? Sibley, because he's back. He's gone to Richmond, says, hey, let me move my brigade up here to Virginia. And the people in Richmond said, well, didn't y'all lose New Mexico? Well, yes. Well, we don't hire losers. And that's kind of the, the traffic they get. So he said, well, send them to Vicksburg. And Pemberton says, no, nah, we don't hire losers either. And that's from Pemberton. And Richard Taylor goes, can they fog a mirror? We'll take them. So they end up going to Louisiana and Sibley's still in command. In the uh, Tesh campaign, uh, Tom Green shows himself to be every bit as ferocious a fighter as he had been in his youth. Now, the senior colonel in the brigade is a guy by the name of James Riley. And James Riley was a hero of early Texas, uh, actually had a diplomatic position under President James Buchanan. He gets killed right outside of Franklin, Louisiana at the Battle of Irish Bend, which is pictured here. Sibley is debilitated again, uh, can't quite keep his head straight, and as Taylor's army disintegrates, Sibley makes his escape. He does not arrange for the rear guard. The rear guard is arranged by Tom Green. And here's what Taylor says about it. If there was a nay in General Taylor's army, that man was Tom Green. Uh, had it not been for the gallantry of Green's regiment and Waller's battalion who covered the retreat, our army would have been entirely cut to pieces. Green and his men have won laurels. The muse of the historian, I guess that's me, will point once again to them. Tom Green is himself a host and worthy of highest consideration. 
This may actually be a photo of Tom Green taken in the fall of 1863 in the town of Opelousas, Louisiana. They had convened a court martial, and there was a group portrait, a very interesting group portrait with all sorts of different faces in it, a couple of enslaved guys in the back, you know, waving, uh, kind of doing a, a photo bomb of the whole group portrait. And the folks at the McElhaney Company, uh, which is Tabasco, uh, sent that to me and said, can you help us identify these guys? And we did that sort of facial recognition technology that you see uh, and looked at the known photos of Green. And this came up with about a 92% match. So uh, he's shorter than you think. He is not that tall a guy. Uh, but you can see that he looks like he's done some hard campaigning. Now, by this point, Green probably hasn't had a sip of liquor since uh, probably before Galveston. But it's in the fall of 1863 that he writes home and said, you know, I kind of caught a cold in all the rain out here. And so I kind of started self-medicating and that made, made, making me feel better. So off the wagon again. Doesn't matter. He's doing what Taylor needs him to do. Uh, and here's what he said. The exact moment when a heavy blow could be given was seized in a masterly manner. He has surpassed my expectations, which I did not think possible. His sphere of usefulness should be enlarged. So if you know anything about Richard Taylor, impressing Richard Taylor is not easy. And so Green does it. And Green gets the star of a Brigadier General from Richard Taylor. What's interesting is Taylor's former right-hand man was Alfred Mouton. And you can see Mouton's reputation slide as Green's climbs. You know, Mouton's great for getting the sort of lead-footed infantry to move around. But if you need somebody to whack somebody, that's Green. So here are his battles in uh, 1863, and these are all over South Louisiana. I've been on many of these fields with y'all. Uh, a great tour. We really ought to do that again sometime when it's boudin season, when the boudin's in season here. Yeah. Yeah. And here's his last battles, the Red River Campaign. So here's the thing that has always been a mystery to me. Green should have been famous. And in 1876, I think he was famous. But I think this is a great passage about how reputations are made. It depends on who you hang with and how those people that you're hanging with spin the story. Because Green was a Texan's Texan. But as the Civil War faded into memory, you had kind of a new impetus to raise the Army of Northern Virginia to great heights. And anybody that participated in it were the new heroes. Green was a Texas guy and was Texas famous. But I like this, uh, this quote. Had his fortunes been cast with armies on a wider theater where his talents and genius would have had more scope, Robert E. Lee and Stonewall Jackson would have leaned, learned to lean upon his strong arm. Wonder what he would have been like in the Army of Tennessee or Army of Northern Virginia or even operating in the Valley. Would have been an interesting story, but that's not the story that was not the life he lived. Instead, he fell at the Battle of Blair's Landing. And I'm sure somebody will ask about his death, and I've got an antidote for that. This was the cause of death. USS Osage. <clears throat> and the question is, well, was he really drunk and charged that gunboat? Well, the chances of him having imbibed before the fight, I think, are pretty good. I think he had an issue with that. 
Did he need the liquid courage? No. But by 1864, he got promoted to major general. He was removed from his 5th Texas, Texas Cavalry. He was removed from his old friend. And he found himself at Blair's Landing with a brigade of troops that were strangers to him, fresh from the state of Texas, never even smelled powder at this point. And one of the things that these new guys were afraid of was gunboats. Well, Green had faced a few by this point, and Taylor thought that everybody's gunboat phobia was overwrought, and he lectured to his commanders, don't fear the gunboats, you can take them. And so Green, to set an example, said, you guys follow me, come up to the levee, and they can't hit you behind that levee, but you can pick off their gunners. So come on, let's go. And these Texas Cavalry regiments were looking at each other like, oh, are you going? <laughs> I'm not sure if I'm going. Green gets up there, the Osage spins that gun around and lets fly. And Green is killed by a piece of naval grape shot that hits him right here about the hairline. And it's a pretty gruesome scene. So he does not make it to the end of the war. He does not have a post-war literary career where he can promote his memory. Instead, he gets a grave in East Austin, uh, Oakwood Cemetery. And you can go and visit that impressive grave to this day. That, ladies and gentlemen, is a story of a Texan of his time, Tom Green. Thank you all. All right, we've got about 12 minutes for questions. What questions do you have about Tom Green? Sir. All right, so how did it come about that he was the namesake of Tom Green County? Because he was awesome. You know, um, one of the things that is remarkable about Green is he is nominated to run for governor while he's in the field. And there's a great uh, article in the Dallas News at the time that says, man, Tom Green would make a good governor, but he's doing great work in the field. And this editorial writer says, look, the government's not as important as good generals in the field. So quit trying to recruit military men to leave the point of contact and come in and just mark time in Austin. So uh, Green had um, a reputation at the time. He also had a number of his veterans that ended up becoming governor of Texas, like Sayers. Governor Sayers was one of Tom Green's guys. Actually wounded at the Battle of Bisland, uh, was involved with the Balverde battery. So he had people that were his friends and people that were his protégés that survived the war. Oren Roberts, another one. And these guys said, look, as we are readmitted back into Texas, and, or back into the Union, Texas is readmitted as a state. We have all this undeveloped territory in the West that are going to be broken into counties. And we got to name them after somebody. So, you know, there's 254 counties in this state. And you can watch the naming convention as it moves West. So Eastern counties are named after American politicians. You ain't got Washington County for Pete's sake. Jefferson, exactly. Uh, you got towns like Dallas and Dallas County. Everybody's going, he was an American politician? Yeah, look him up, Wikipedia. Um, <laughs> then, once the state is established, you have this Republic of Texas vibe. So, for instance, Taylor County, Abilene, is uh, named for two brothers that were killed at the Alamo. So there's a bunch of Texas Revolution folks. Then after that, you have the Civil War folks. So you have Tom Green. You have Val Verde County, which is Del Rio. You have Jeff Davis County. And everybody says, well, you can't have a Texas county named after the president of the Confederacy. I said, we don't. You're named after the Secretary of War. And the great uh, chairman of the Committee for Building Our National Capital. So just focus on that. Um, and you have Lubbock County, et cetera. 
So he is part of that way. You know, there's even a hood county. So that's how that process starts. Sorry, in the back. Do you know why uh, Company B in the 4th Texas chose Tom Green Rifles as their name for their company? Because he was a bona fide Texas hero. And they all came from the neighborhood. And they said, all right, we need somebody that can be our inspiration. And so from time to time, you see, and this goes on across uh, regiments north and south, in which a company will take as their totem, their uh, patron saint, if you will, uh, some name of somebody they consider a hero. So you've got Tom Green Rifles in Hood's Brigade. You have the W.P. Lane Raiders. And, uh, you know, W.P. Lane was an interesting dude, uh, especially an interesting guy to name your company after. And so when you're looking through the, if you're looking through the, the people in Texas that you want to be, take as your mascot, green pops to the surface. I mean, pretty, pretty easily. Um, and so that's kind of the process. It's an informal arrangement. There's a question over here. Yes, sir. Yes, uh, because there was two Thomas Greens in the Republic of Texas period. One was Tom Green, our hero. So the question is, why do they have to use both names? Uh, because his name was Tom Green, which is pretty common. Try Googling it. You know, it's crazy uh, what all pops up. So the other Thomas Jefferson Green in the Republic of Texas was kind of a scalawag ne'er-do-well. Uh, he was the guy that tried to, to lead a boarding party in Lynch, Santa Ana, amongst other things. And then he didn't persist. I mean, he ends up going back to North Carolina. And so they wanted to make sure that everybody knew which Tom Green they're naming it after. Not that knucklehead from Velasco, but, you know, our hero. So, question back here. But I was just going to comment on the last words of Tom Green. Yeah. yeah. That he said, supposedly, he said, I give a million from all the great brigades and the Valerie Bennett. Yep, yep. In, in response to your comment about his uh, unfamiliarity with the men around the free and the government. Yeah, I mean, he, uh, so the, the comment, if you didn't hear it in the back, uh, some of his last words, if not his last words, were, I'd give anything to have my old brigade and the Valverde battery in this fight. Because they're seasoned veterans. I know these guys by name. I would recognize these guys by the way they walked, even if their back was to me. You know, that's the kind of relationship he had. And what he has is a brigade of strangers. And he's trying to buck them up. And there's only so much you can do. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. The uh, naval lab, Collison Bay. Yeah. Two questions. The Collison Bay system is very large. In what part of the Bay system did the battle occur, and have there been excavations since? Okay. Then? So the question is about the Battle of Galveston and exactly what the battlefield was, and do we have any relics from that battle? I am going to defer to my colleague. You sticking around for the next uh, presentations? Or will you be here the rest of the day? Yes. Yeah. Okay, good. Because I'm going to defer that question to the world's leading expert on the Battle of Galveston, which is Ed Cobb. And not only are there artifacts, Ed's held them. Not only is there a battlefield, Ed can tell you where the chip in that, you know, building is not urban decay. It's actually from, you know, naval grape shot going down the street. So I'm going to leave that question lie and let Ed field it in his presentation. I'm sure he covers it uh, probably in a slide or two. Yes, sir. You were talking about how Tom Green might have been in on the beginning. I think he takes some game of what they have because he's one of them. And he takes some game. If we, they had no doubt, they didn't like you, you were gone. Correct. Right. And I think when Tom Green had been in, maybe he would have had survival in the World Market Center. I don't know. So I think it would have been very well accepted by Gerald Clinton. It may have, but General Hood wouldn't call on the shots. And, of course, it also depends on the messenger. So the question is, or the comment is, oh, he'd have fit in great in Army of Northern Virginia. Uh, but the messenger that's carrying that to Richmond is Henry Hopkins Sibley. <coughs> and Sibley's campaign in New Mexico was considered a disaster. And he was considered a drunk. 
that uh, excerpt that I uh, read about, you know, there's going to be some come up and come up. Uh, that went to Richmond. So the advanced press from New Mexico was, well, the reason they didn't win is because they're all a bunch of lushes. Had they all been teetotalers and professionals, they would have whipped those Yankees, which I can tell you from a deep dive on that subject, that is not so. Yes, ma'am. Uh, the funeral for Tom Green when he came back was yes. massive. Yeah, so the funeral for Tom Green was massive. And it was a, first of all, it's in Austin, which is a good place to hold a funeral. Um, and so all the locals showed up, and that includes your entire state government, many of whom were proteges and friends of uh, Tom Green. And uh, there is a funeral, uh, his eulogy and his present, his the eulogy and the presentation at his funeral is great literature. It is absolutely gorgeous. And so, you know, in the fullness of time, I would love to write his biography uh, because he is such a great example of Texans of a particular time and place. You know, people ask me, how come Texas is canted the way it is? Civil War made this state. It crafted its attitudes. You know, people don't realize that by 1876, there's 2,000% more farms in Texas than there were before the war. Where are all these guys coming from? South Carolina, Mississippi, Alabama, Tennessee. Texas starts filling up with people and they carry with them in their noggins a particular worldview. And so um, I think that that funeral in Austin is a great example of some people saying, you know what? We came in second in this war. But doesn't mean we have to lose. You know, essentially Texas from 1865 on becomes the fifth quarter. Now what's interesting to me, scholar of the entire uh, sweep and breadth of Texas history is that Texas by 1900 just becomes a glorified overstuffed Alabama. I mean, if you just took Alabama and watered it well and put it in sunshine, it had grown into Texas. And that across the entire sweep of every issue, whether you're talking about industry, yeah, we're picking cotton, talking about uh, Society, absolutely. Uh, talking about things like racism or other sort of you know, blights, it's there. So what makes Texas different is we are a big overstuffed Alabama that hits oil. And so then you can start crafting a whole different future. You know, all Alabama's got is Alabama whether you take that as the football team or whatever. That's what they have to crow about. Texas has now become so diverse and it has such a, it has been good, a good, good steward of its prosperity that we're poised for something really remarkable. I'm just not sure what it is right now. Uh, but we're still in the, in the act of becoming. So I'm going to leave you with these words so that we can stay on schedule. What we're doing at the Texas Center is we're telling this Texas story. And the ultimate goal here, I mean, the first big deliverable that Ben Preberg, who's down here and y'all met last night, and I, uh, what we're going to deliver on is we're going to tell that Texas story for the next generation because people have quit telling it. There's lots of people that have an opinion on the Texas story. They just have no idea what the Texas story is. I don't know if y'all know people that have opinions about stuff that they know nothing about. But this is absolutely the world that we now inhabit. And so the question is, who's going to tell your story? And who you trust to tell your story? So we're going to put our, we're going to throw our hat in that ring. We're going to wade right into that conversation. 
And we're going to tell that Texas story and hopefully get it in the classrooms across the state, get it in front of people like you across the state. 255 minute videos. You can watch it in your pajamas. By the time you're done with all 250 of those five minute videos, then you can have an opinion. You don't have to agree with me. This is by no means the final word on it. But it is a place to reestablish a common language so that we can have informed discussions instead of internet spats. Okay. Thank y'all. I always love having y'all here.